the FX Street. Welcome to today's webinar. I think it'll be the last one, but it was <clears throat> that we'll have on France for a while. We've done quite a few, but it was inevitable. We could not uh, conduct a webinar the morning after the rather historic French election in many ways without uh, dealing with its what it says about France and what it says about Europe. Europe, the European Union, and all of the topics that we deal with here on a weekly basis. The chart that you're looking at is a chart of the euro against the dollar and a chart of the, and some of it is projected, of course, of the French franc against the dollar. Now, these two charts are by nature of their quoting reversed. The French franc was quoted against the dollar and the dollar is quoted against the euro. So they're essentially a mirror image of each other. One of the more interesting facts of this chart is exactly how integrated they are. Now, from 1999 on, of course, when they uh, officially got rid of the euro, of the French franc, at least in the interbank market, since the percentages at which each of the European countries entered, currencies entered the euro, from 1999, from right about here, you will not see anything except a mirror image. But before that, all they've done is project backwards. The reason I chose this chart, of course, when you get back before the euro, you have a much more interesting situation here. Back in the early, in the 60s, you had fixed currencies. Remember, this was the year of Bretton Woods. Um, until the 70s when things started to gyrate a little bit after uh, Richard Nixon abandoned the Bretton Woods plan in, I believe, 1973. The point I'm trying to make with this chart is that France is, whatever its voting potential and whatever its voting decisions, completely integrated into the continental European both culture and economic system. This was true before the euro and it's true after the euro. So the decisions that the French electorate make are important, but they're less important than they seem. Even I think this is true of the Brexit negotiations, which we're about to see commence Britain's association with Europe is one that will continue, and it's one that is the benefit, a thriving relationship is a benefit to both parties. There was always a bit of hyperbole, more than a bit, I think, in this French election. I think two points can be taken away, but I think they're both, one is different than, the, one is more important than the other, but let's, let's start at the beginning. This election, now we all know journalism and writing up and narrative thrives on conflict. So there wasn't any way that this election was going to be portrayed as anything except a potential Armageddon. There has never, there has not been a poll um, throughout the election that showed uh, Marine Le Pen and the National Front doing anything but losing by large amounts. And that's exactly what happened here. The percentages as if portrayed here in the United States, 65, 35, would be a rocketing landslide. And I assume they are in France as well. I say assume because there is a sort of a hidden factor in France, which doesn't happen nearly as much in the United States or in Britain. Um, the French often mark their ballots for something called abstention. That means you voted, but you chose no one. 
in the US or in Britain, I believe that has to be, you could write in nothing, but your vote really doesn't get counted. The French, it's a category. And so 25% of the voters who voted in France cast their ballots for abstention. This is a, a comment on the current election. And it's one which I think deserves more interest than it's being given. Because the overall portrayal of this election, and I think justified in many ways, has been as a vote for or against Europe. Or for against France, if you listen, to, if you believe the uh, campaign rhetoric of the National Front of Marine Le Pen. And one thing that this abstention vote is telling you is the degree of dissension, is the degree of dissatisfaction. Now, it is not yet at a level to provoke a majority vote for throwing over the traces of the EU, but it is certainly not diminished. In fact, over the past 20 years since the EU started, the National Front's vote has essentially doubled. It's gone from 18, 17.8%, I believe in 2002, when Jean-Marie Le Pen ran against Jacques Chirac and was trounced to today's vote, which is still a trouncing by any democratic standards, but it is a doubling of her support. It's a doubling of her program. There were three basic issues, if you will, two really. Um, but they can all get lumped together. There's the issue of economic growth. There's the issue of French culture. Uh, and there's the issue of immigration. You could say that the uh, the cultural and immigration issues are one, but their their effect might be, but they're uh, they're quite different in how they play out. There is a parallel, of course. I'm always looking for parallels um, to the United States. Um, you say, how? How is that possible? Um, the rebellious candidate did not win. There is a parallel. Um, Donald Trump, uh, the President of the United States, had never held political office on any level, elected political office on any level before his election. First time that's ever happened here in the United States. Emmanuel Macron had never held elected political office before uh, yesterday's victory. So both that's, a, I think, a very important point. The electorate in both countries, despite the difference in their backgrounds, was willing overwhelmingly in the France, perhaps because of her opponent, and overwhelmingly geographically in the United States to elect an untried political leader to the highest position in the country. This is not a normal state of affairs in democratic polities. And it is certainly emblematic of something that is going on in both of these countries. Now, you know, in reading over all of the reactions and listening to the news over the weekend and spending getting staying rather late last night reading all the reports, um, there wasn't a lot of surprise in this election. Uh, as, I, as I said, there was never a poll that showed Macron uh, polling less than 60%. Um, it would have, despite some of the rather poor performance of polling entities, uh, in the last couple of major elections in the West, certainly the Brexit election and, and the presidential election in the United States, and to some degree the election in Holland, the Gert Wilders election with uh, Root, who retained his, his prime ministership, 
polling had been off by substantial amounts. Um, but when we say substantial amounts, perhaps that is because the overall success of polling has been relatively good. This election in France would have required an enormous swing, 10% uh, from one side to the other, and that was simply not happening. It would have been more than 10%. Um, and that it simply did not happen and was never really likely to happen. So many of the, a number of the articles I read that were uh, along the lines of bullet dodged, Armageddon avoided, along these lines. That if Marine Le Pen had won, you had the end of the Euro, end of Europe scenario. I'm sure about two seconds after a Le Pen victory, they would immediately have every commentator, especially every public commentator, would have started trotting out the parallels to the 1930s, uh, which would have been unfortunate and mistaken, and since the victory didn't happen, don't matter any, don't matter at the moment. But I think that is a mistaken view of what is transpiring here. The analysis of, of Marine Le Pen's positions would, had she won, been a direct, a clear and present danger to the Euro and to the European Union. There's no question about that. But since that was never really in the cards, we have to look, we can't use that as the standards, we shouldn't use that as the standard for analyzing this election. Had there been a very close vote, had it been close on the way up, had it been 49-51 or something like that, you could say that the Euro was survived a bullet. But even in that situation, and perhaps even more so in that situation, you would be taking the wrong view. At least it would be, in my mind, the wrong analysis, the wrong conclusion. Because the conclusion that is, I think, more appropriate in France, the population, the voting population, was willing to take the chance on an essentially untried political leader. Now, he's not untried in the sense he's never been in politics. Um, he was the uh, economics minister, I believe, for the Hollande socialist government. One would assume that if he was a minister in the socialist government of Bernard Hollande, then his political and economic prescriptions were acceptable to a socialist administration. That Emile Macron is essentially a socialist. It would be hard to come to other, another conclusion since he served in the Hollande administration and those beliefs must have been vetted. It appears, though, that the electorate wasn't at all interested in that, and that the most uh, a sign of his and his parties, which is about a year old, assessment of the situation is takes a great deal from the Donald Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign, and that is that it was time and possible for an outsider, especially in Mr. Macron's case. Um, essentially a phony outsider. He's hardly an outsider to the French political system. He is um, a product of the French, uh, I think it's called École Normale Supérieure, the centralized training university for almost all French bureaucrats and politicians. He is not a man of the outside. Donald Trump was absolutely, for as far as the political system goes, a man on the outside. Um, the 15 year campaign or more of Nigel Farage and others 
to remove Britain from the successful campaign to remove Britain from the EU was without a doubt an outsider campaign. The entire political establishment, including the current Prime Minister, Theresa May, supported continued membership in the EU. But in Mr. Macron's case, a very correct and succinct analysis told him that, and told his, his advisors, that it's time for an outside candidate. And so he formed a political party, neither right nor left, supposedly, but this is not true. He will still have to staff his administration. And who is he going to staff it with? He's going to staff it with people that he knew from his previous stint in government, most likely. Therefore, you're going to have a socialist type of government. In addition, Mr. Macron was the only candidate in the uh, election going back to the first round, who is a four-score supporter of the European project, of further integration, of a phrase which is not used much anymore, but the ever closer union of the euro. So there's a, there's a question here which has not been answered. And it starts with Marine Le Pen and the absentee vote, the abstention vote, not the absentee vote, the abstention vote, and the dissatisfaction with the performance of the French government by large groups of the population. They're dissatisfied with the economy. I'll show you a chart here, hold on. Now, this is a chart of this is the euro going back a year. And you can see right here is the first round on the French election. There, there's a gap right here from here to here. The first round on the French election was really the election because um, the only question was whether a centrist or at least a standard, a normal political candidate would be the one to oppose Marine Le Pen, um, or was Le Pen gonna, gonna leave? So, gonna not make it. So the huge spike in the Euro was from that election, the first election. Now let's look at the five minute chart. And you can see the election is here, May 7th, right here, this column right here. And you can see that there was a brief spike. This is, this is standard market stuff. This is not a political judgment or a comment on Mr. Macron's potential. He's the youngest prime minister, I think, in French history. He's 39, which is pretty impressive. He has been a outstanding uh, brilliant student from his early days, an unusual personal life. Um, you may discover that for your own on the web. I will not comment on it. It is interesting though. Um, and the reaction of the Euro has been pretty much by the rumor and sell the fact. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that that would be, I mean, there isn't any surprise in this election. Um, from a volatility point of view, it would have been a good, a good, we would have gotten much more volatile volatility in the markets had Marine Le Pen won. I'm not advocating Mrs. Le Pen's candidacy. I'm just stating a clear fact that the unexpected result that Ms. Penn's, Ms. Penn's election would have been would have been quite dramatic in its effect on the year. We'd probably be about 101 right now in the era. Well, maybe not, maybe 104. Um, so the reaction of the, of the markets was blase, as you would expect from such an expected result. Okay, so but let's put the euro in its five-year context here. So clearly the French are not willing to give up on the euro and the European Union here. You know, there is an alternative view here um, that what you're seeing in this rise in dissatisfaction with basically industrial 
developed industrial societies, a lot of it having to do with the hollowing out of the industrial base for the working class, meaning jobs. There are, you know, take an example in, in the, uh, the early part of the 19th century in Britain, when agricultural work became uneconomic. When British farmers, because both of the climate, topography, and the system of land ownership and technology, could no longer compete with the vast spaces of the American Midwest, grain ships from Australia. And so the agricultural workers were displaced, lost their jobs, and flooded into the cities for the new satanic mills, as they were called at the time. And many of the traditional crafts suffered the same implosion of jobs, of living standards. And even then, with the imperfect British electoral system, meaning that it wasn't, it wasn't universal, universal suffrage, it wasn't um, even universal male suffrage. Um, there, there was quite a varied system, much of it inherited from the early days of the Middle Ages. Um, but even then, there was pressure, although not sufficient pressure. Also, they had a much stronger class system there, and the classes, the ruling classes, were in much greater uh, powerful position than they are, say, in the United States. There was still tremendous pressure on the political system from the disappointed, the losers of the process of economic transformation. Well, here in the United States, that process came to power. Here, not here, but in Britain, that process, those voters came to power. In France, that has not taken place. So we're gonna ask two questions about this. Is there something that's different about France? Maybe it's position in the continent. Or have things not gotten bad enough to support the kind of overthrow of the political system that would have to happen, perhaps, to support a successful candidacy of Marine Le Pen. The euro, as we've seen here in this chart, as a reflection of the French election, is basically nowhere. I mean, it's a very minor blip. This is the big move. This, of course, is based on ECB and uh, Fed rate policy primarily. And since then, there's been a relatively, benign, not benign, but relatively limited range. The issue here is telling you that the problems of the EU, the problems of the Euro are not the problems, the problem of them is not the French election if the status quo won as it did. This is telling you, because after all, remember through this entire period here where there was going to be, and even here where there's going to be a French election, the euro was already lower. It wasn't the pending problem of the French election that drove the euro down. I mean, there's been a lot of talk this year I've indulged it, some of it myself, that this whole year, 2017 of elections, is a crisis period for the Euro and for the European Union. That's clearly been an exaggerated concern. It's in fact distracting, as I think this election did, um, from the real concerns of the viability of the Euro. It is telling us that things are nowhere near difficult enough for a majority of people in the countries that are having elections 
to consider such a drastic move as seceding from the European Union or the Euro. Part of the reason is Britain, it was easy. They already had their own currency. When the considerations become, and this is of course, I don't know if it's something that the EU planners thought out. They seem to think that the, the Euro would bring in such a bright rosy dawn that no one would ever want to leave. But what seems to be the case is that the Euro has brought in a very, very uneven and for many painful present, but that the penalties for leaving are so high that short of economic Armageddon, basically, nobody's willing to take that risk. That seems to be the case. Greece, unwilling to take the risk. France, unwilling to take the risk. Holland, unwilling to take the risk. My guess is Italy and France, Italy and Germany, will come to the same conclusion. So you end up with something which is disliked by many, many people, but for whom the system, until it collapses, is too difficult to leave. This is a dire prediction for the EU. Because the EU, in my view, runs the risk for large portions of the population. You know, it seems to be like, if you look in, in Italy, that the, 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 that the, the five-star movement is, is polling in the lead. But my guess is that at this moment, you will have the same issue. After all, for most people in France, uh, having been to France many times, the situation is not so dire to upend their lives. I think that will be the same thing of Italy. I'll report back in August um, after I spend a few weeks with my family in Italy, and we'll know how the Italians are talking about this and get my Italian up to speed so I can do the conversations. But the euro is running a risk of not gathering in the loyalties of its people, of the people it rules. In France and Italy and others, it is an economic drag. In Germany, it's not an economic drag, it's an economic benefit, but the penalties that go with it, all of the taxes that they have to spend to support the rest of the euro, makes it also a somewhat unpopular item. In the end, and I'm not drawing a parallel here, but sounding a warning, in the end, the Soviet Union collapsed because no one was willing to defend it. It wasn't really an active rebellion in the sense that there were revolutionaries in the streets, that there was armed rebellion. It almost, ironically, withered away, as in Marxist terminology, the state in the end of days was supposed to wither away and usher in some sort of utopia. There was no one willing because the system had obviated every bit of loyalty from the people it ruled. And this appears to be, at the moment, the path that the Euro and the EU is on. It is too difficult, and there's no planning, and the situation is not dire enough to force the issue through an election. Remember, Britain was already separate with its own currency. But unless the EU reforms and the Euro reforms, loyalty and support will continue to bleed away. Now, Mr. Macron ran, not quite as an outsider, as a third choice. Um, to my analysis, this is simply not true. He is a man of the French establishment. He's one of their brightest products. He's an attractive candidate. 
He is very well spoken. He's a great debater. He has enormous command of facts and he's brilliant. But the role that he must play is one that I don't think that the standard view. After all, the fact that he's heading a novel political party doesn't really mean anything because he will, in power, be a complete uh, member of the establishment. He essentially has no political base for opposing the types of policies that Marine Le Pen was at least willing to think about. There isn't going to be any pressure. So, so the, the basic problem for Mr. Macron is that the issues, the economic issues, the cultural issues, the immigration issues, that are very much on the minds. Remember that 25 cent percent abstention vote. Combine that. You know, it's interesting, the, uh, just as a sidelight, the 40% of the French electorate that voted in the first round for Marine Le Pen and Mélenchon, the, uh, the uh, leftist, uh, he's essentially a communist, um, that's 40% of the vote. That entire vote did not revert or continue with Marine Le Pen in the second round. About 5%, my guess is, of Mr. Mélenchon's vote either went to abstention or voted for Emile Emmanuel Macron. So it's not dissatisfaction with the status quo, obviously does not translate 100% to a candidate for whom your their other beliefs, their other principles are not congruent with yours. Nevertheless, um, two thirds of that particular vote apparently voted for Marine Le Pen or from some other area. So the problems that Mr. Macron will have to deal with are not ones that he is either tempera uh, I shouldn't say temperamentally, I don't know, but politically or support wise, ooh, ugly word, that either his political base, such as it is, um, or the political and economic training he has and his beliefs is equipped to deal with. One of the things that I think we can agree on is that the, I mean, with people who don't agree, is that the Euro and the EU and Brussels is not sufficiently serving the needs of the European populations. Now, it's true that the Europeans are not willing to turn their back as of the moment on the post-war political settlement, the international, national political settlement in Europe, which is essentially the EU. As I've said many times, the EU's purpose as conceived and in fact as executed was to avoid the repetition of the first 50 years of the 20th century. That's an admirable and probably very necessary goal considering the traumas, the horrors of the first 50 years for the Europeans, first 45 years of the European uh, century, uh, which opened with the most promising, uh, probably cent century opening in the history of the world, the 19th into the 20th century, and dissolved into horror uh, for two world wars. 
So the Europeans are clearly not willing to give that up, but they are not yet anyway. Um, but they are willing to give up internally the national political settlement that has existed since the Second World War. That's true in France. It's clearly true in Britain. It may very well be true in Italy, and it was almost true in Holland, or closer than before. Um, it may actually be true in Germany. We don't know. What do I say when I when I say this? What do I mean? The standard political it was true in the United States. The standard political layout between the parties and beliefs and candidates didn't hold. The electorate wanted something else, rather inchoate idea. In many in many cases, that kind of emotional movement is one that political leaders sense, give voice to, and mold to their own uses. That is absolutely the lesson of Donald Trump in the United States. Marine Le Pen was less successful. The French and the National Front and nationalism in general, as it's viewed, and populism, has a much more difficult history in Europe and a history still around in living memory. So it is much more difficult for any movement, any political movement, that smacks of that type of emotions and that type of worldview to gain. Nevertheless, it has shown its strength for the moment. So of Mr. Macron's tasks, what is the market telling us this morning about his potential for success? Well, it's telling us he doesn't really have that much, or at least there's been no change. Mr. Macron is a politician of the establishment. As I said, the fact that he ran as a novel political party is, if not irrelevant, it is a bit of a sleight of hand. Here's another, this is another, uh, here, this is the French comparison between the French and German unemployment rates. Um, going back about uh, 25 years. And there's an interesting and unfortunate dichotomy. And look when it starts. It starts right about here. Wait, is this, is this, yes, French and German, sorry. Okay, so French, the French, the German rate is in purple. The French, and this is one of the reasons it's going on here, and, and it's a very, it's a very odd, unfortunately, these are not on the same scale. Oh, I should have fixed that. Okay, so we have the German at 7.2. Remember, this is unification time. And one of the reasons this went up is because of the unification of uh, Eastern Germany and their unemployed started being counted. And we have the French in uh, yellow, maroon, uh, orange actually. The, it's the same scale. No, they're, not, they're almost the same scale, actually. This is 10 and this is 10.0, so they're almost the same scale. The difference becomes manifest at the session. The German rate looks like the United States, relatively speaking, meaning it peaked and then went down. And 
the French rate went up and has essentially not come down. This is one of the sources, maybe the main source of discontent, economic discontent. The issues of French culture and immigration are there, and they've been made much worse over the past two years by the German insistence on running its own per, its own national immigration policy for all of the EU. But the difference stemming from 2000 is also notable. For this period here, you had a relative similarity. But, but, but one thing that, 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 that needs to be shown over this particular issue is that the German unemployment rate started out way down here at seven. Um, and if you even go to this point here, as they were absorbing East Germany, the French was much higher. The result of the unification brought this period of German unemployment here. My guess is that had that not been the case, it would have plunged along with the French through 2000 and down here. I'll also remember that the bottom on this is 5.8 for Germany. And uh, they're slightly different. One is ILO, one is not. And about 7% for the French, both considerably higher than what we have in the United States right now, which is 4.5%. But this split, now almost 10 years old, is one of the strongest forces driving the French dissatisfaction. So for this particular issue, which my guess probably trumps the immigration issue as well, although perhaps it's not quite as emotional. What are Mr. Macron's chances of affecting positive change on this? The markets are telling you none or very little because there's no acceleration, there's no positive movement in the euro essentially or really anywhere else in the markets right now. The issue with France, in fact, which is why I'm pessimistic short term and probably medium term as well in the Euro, is that there isn't going to be any effective change in France on this particular issue. Mr. Macron and his party are not equipped. Here's another, here's another one. This is French GDP since 1960. It's not a great graph, but you can see that the trend, as with the United States, as with many industrial countries, is like this. It's from left to right. If anything is distressing, as with the United States here, it's this period here, post-recession. U.S. growth has been about uh, two-thirds of what it normally is, post-recession. We can argue for days and days about what the reason for that is, or the reasons for that are is, but the fact is inescapable. And in an economy the size of the United States or France or any other industrial economy, a missing, potentially, and missing 33% growth rate of the growth rate is a phenomenal amount of stuff, of wealth that's not created and distributed, however perfectly, to the population. If you compare, um, average, as I do every time the uh, non-farm payrolls come out, non-farm payrolls uh, wage increases to inflation, the differential has been uh, considerably under 1% for most of the past 10 years. And this is true in France as well. It's true in economic terms that the 
increases of wealth and substance that populations had become used to is no longer happening. And in Europe, the euro gets a lot of the blame. Of course, the problem with that argument, or at least a supplement to that argument, is that you are seeing the same type of anemic growth in the United States. Clearly, the euro is not the problem here. But the political ramifications are the same in both cases. So from a medium term or a near to medium term view for the currencies and for the markets, the selection is nowhere. There's no sense in the market prior or post that this election, Emmanuel Macron, is going to provide, and maybe he will. He's certainly an accomplished figure. And even though he essentially came, politically anyway, from nowhere much as Donald Trump did, um, that doesn't mean that there's either incapacity, clearly means they're not, or that he will be resisted by the status quo. And to be sure he will, I don't think in Europe, less so than in the United States, there is that much pressure. The centralized system in Europe, on the continent, certainly in France, makes the makes change more difficult. Here in the United States, there is a whole nother level of powerful governments that have enormous responsibilities, their own budgets, their own leaders, their own political complexion, meaning the states, of course, that operate in many ways independently and serve as a petri dish. You remember that from your high school chemistry, or biology, actually. Um, for experimentation on political process. It gives the American system a great deal more flexibility. States can try policies that will work, and then they can be moved to the federal government. It's a little more difficult in France, since almost everything runs. A rather astonishing figure in France um, is that basically everybody's a socialist. 57% of the French GDP, 57%, more than half, not insubstantially more than half, runs through the central government in Paris. Any reform, any economic reform in France has a very difficult constituency. And there certainly isn't any sense that I feel that Mr. Macron, despite his rhetoric, some of his rhetoric anyway, has any mandate to do almost anything. Yes, I know the vote was 65%. You know, I, I, one interesting uh, comment I'd make. I read a lot of articles over the weekend and, and, and this morning um, on the election in France. And it was almost uniform. Every single reference to the National Front or to meet Marine Le Pen was prefaced by the term far right or extreme right. Every one. There was no descriptive terms applied to Emmanuel Macron. So clearly, the entire world of the scribes, or as Herman Melville called them, the ink-stained wretches, although I don't think he was referring specifically to journalists, 
had already had already chosen their sides. Um, some of Ms. Ms. Le Pen's views were antithetical to the European consensus as represented by the media and others. And to them, of course, any view that disagrees with theirs is far and extreme. But I don't find, and I don't think many of her economic ideas, so right wing. In a sense, they were nationalistic. She is um, addressing what a clear large portion of the population, although a minority, feels are important economic issues in France. So just an aside. So where do we go now, both in the markets and in French politics? There's, of course, the French a parliamentary election coming up. Um, Mr. Macron's election does not herald a movement that is going to sweep. He doesn't really have a party. He created one less than a year ago, about a year ago. So there isn't going to be any power base in the French parliament for Mr. Macron to back him up, to pass his policies, whatever they are. So it's almost a guarantee of continuation of the status quo in France. And if that continues, as the euro and the European project has been a 70-year project, and the euro itself is at this point about a 25-year project from 1992, the Maastricht Treaty, it's also possible that its undoing is a generational item also. I still view the euro, regardless of this election or the Italian election, as untenable in its present form. The fact that European populations, European voters, are not yet ready, or are not ready, let's say yet ready, are not ready to dissolve this attempt does not mean that the attempt is earning its loyalty. It seems to me that the type of loyalty that the Euro and the EU is gaining is one of resignation. That if it does not begin at some point to deliver benefits to a much larger swath of the European population, you will get other elections. This has been a, 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 an interim result. It's clear that Mr. Macron ran as an outsider. He's not, but he ran outside the post-war political settlement in France. Combine that, so he thought that, the winning candidate thought that was necessary, and he was right. The other two portions of the vote, Marine Le Pen's vote and the abstention vote, are far more extreme in that belief. So if that's the case, and that clearly is what the voters and the electorate are telling us, it's what the markets are telling us. Then the issue has not gone away with the election of Emmanuel Macron. It has not gone away with the defeat of Gert Wilders in Holland. It will only go away when the issues that supported it begin to dissipate. And if it's true, as I believe, 
that in addition to the demographic and natural aging of both economies and populations that you're seeing in Europe, there are other, because you know, if you look at a country like Italy, it's not so pronounced in France, but in Italy, the economy essentially hasn't grown. I think it's maybe time to do something on Italy, but it's going to be more of the same. So maybe I'll wait till uh, August when I come back from from the continent, from Italy, um, to talk about it, because I'll be able to put in some personal observations as well. But the Italian economy essentially hasn't grown since the advent of the euro. So the resentment, at least when polled in sort of a nebulous question uh, about the euro, the Italians say, yeah, they're you know dissatisfied with the euro. Whether this translates into a vote to reject the euro is an entirely different topic, as we're seeing in France now. The two are not the same and should never be equated, although they often are. People are well aware, I think, of the enormous dislocation that would be brought on by an election of Marine Le Pen, or that the Triumph, the victory of the Five Star Movement in a national election in Italy. Even if they are both, as with Macron in France, there's no organized legislative power constituency for this. In fact, there is nothing but an organized, powerful opposition to changing the status quo. Because after all, where are the power structures? represented best? Well, in the corridors of power, in Paris, in Rome, in Brussels, in Turin. The people whose benefit and the classes and uh, institutions that benefit from the status quo in Europe, it's not just picking on Europe, it's true in any uh, organized successful country, are the ones who are represented in the bureaucracy in all of the middle and upper reaches, except perhaps the top of any country's political establishment. So here in the United States, the representatives of all these things are in Congress. They're represented in Congress. They have access to Congress. The people's access is basically through elections. They can elect Donald Trump. They can elect various legislators, but the entire structure of the political establishment and the country is geared towards serving largely the needs of the powerful. And this is true in France as well. So Mr. Macron will confront a bureaucracy and a power structure committed and if you will addicted to the status quo. That is not going to change. So unless he is able to, through dint of political skill, intellectual acumen, and strength of will, to move the, the system a few degrees on the needle to perform better, to provide better growth, you are not going to see any change. And then in five years, We'll be back where we started from with the French electorate. Now, I heard one of the things I listened to on the way in was uh, someone's analysis that, you know, the, that Europe is now growing faster than the United States. I have to research this. I have heard this so many times before, certainly in the 10 years or almost 10 years since the financial crash. It never turns out to be true. You have to check, you know, lies, damn lies on statistics. You certainly have to check the source of these things. So there's nothing in the past 10 years or the past 25 years that is giving any sense that Europe is about to bust out with economic growth, satisfy everybody's economic needs, and be happy. The Euro and the European Union has added degrees of complexity, 
actually, I just got an interesting book. Um, who's one of their, it's one of its uh, theses, is that the complexity that is added to, in a matter of natural course, the development of human societies and, and bureaucracies, the complexity that is added generation after generation to the structures of a complicated and functioning society are one of the causes of its demise because each constituency in the system ends up with a representation in the bureaucracy and the power structure someplace. And as more and more things and people and interests are represented, there are fewer and fewer and absorb more resources. There are fewer and fewer resources left for external challenges. And the external challenges do not have to be an invasion across the Rhine in 350 or 376 AD or 406. There are many other types of challenges too. And then eventually society is, ends up devoting all of its resources to sustaining internal competition, internal renting, rent seeking, if you will, or as uh, I um, as de Tocqueville said, democracies function until people learn that they can vote themselves benefits from the system. Okay, folks, um, I thank you all very much for attending. I hope this has been in some use, um, an analysis of some of the problems facing the French government of Emile Macron and the French population and the European project in general. Uh, this Wednesday, we will be interviewing Steve Neeson, the founder of Candle Charting here in the West. He brought it to the West 25 or 30 years ago, has been one of its chief popularizers and educators, fascinating man, great guy, know him personally, we used to work together. Um, so I hope you'll all come uh, and attend at uh, 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning here. Mr. Neeson will have a great deal to say about charting, candle charting in particular, about how it benefits a trader and the origin and how we brought it here to the United States on the West. Thank you all for attending um, and we will see you hopefully on Wednesday. Everyone have a good day.